Bibles tonight, please. We're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And this is our second night of prophecy study. We began a couple of weeks ago. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm going to continue the study. I don't know how long we'll be in the study of prophecy. We could take a long time if we want to. Um, I'm going to preach some of very similar messages that I did three and a half years ago. And I want you, uh, for some of you, these are going to be uh, very similar messages to things you already know, that you're all already familiar with. Uh, for others, these, pr these principles, these truths are going to be brand new to you. And uh, I want to encourage you, as I do with every principle, every truth, to go to the Word of God and see if these things are so. Uh, if I preach something you haven't heard before, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's right either. Uh, go to the Word of God and see if it's so. See if these things are true. And so I want to encourage you as we enter this study of prophecy to uh, maybe go back and listen to some of these messages again. Uh, maybe take some notes uh, if you're not as familiar with these principles. Um, I was raised in a home, as I've told you before, where I literally was taught to read from the Bible. And my dad has been through the Bible more times than any person I've ever heard of. And I've, I've heard of a lot of people. I know I haven't heard of everybody, uh, but I've heard of a lot of people. And my dad has been through the Bible, been through the Bible. And he would read through the Bible and he would say things to me when he would read about tribulation. And he'd read about some of the things coming on the earth. And he'd say, Tim, he'd say, I, I really, I feel like there's some of these things we're going to go through. And I'd just kind of dismiss it and I'd say, no, dad, don't worry about that. We're out of here for anything happens, you know. And uh, that's, that's what most of us, how the doctrine that we've been taught growing up is uh, what's called pre-trib rapture, meaning that we'll be gone before a seven-year tribulation. And what you'll discover with me, I believe, if you'll dig into what the Bible actually says, is that there's no such thing as a seven-year tribulation, uh, but that uh, the fact is that God's people will face tribulation, but not the wrath of God. In fact, uh, the, the position when I preached this three and a half years ago, it was a culmination of a year and a half of great in-depth study. I mean, going through literally thousands of verses and, and just pouring over the scriptures to find out what does God's word say about this. And uh, so, you know, three and a half years ago, I think it was in February of 2019, I preached a message called, Is There a Difference Between Tribulation and Wrath? And tonight I'm going to preach a totally different message called, Is There a Difference between wrath and tribulation, okay? And so, uh, you know, if you've never heard this message before, you never have, okay? You never have. I just told you the new title. Um, is there a difference between wrath and tribulation or tribulation and wrath? Uh, the fact is, as I said, when I first preached this three and a half years ago, I had just come freshly from my own study of digging into this for a year and a half, and so I literally put hundreds of verses. I mean, in, in many mess, some of the messages had 150, 200 verses. And uh, we still got out rather on time because I read really fast. And uh, I'm, I'm still going to cover a lot of scripture. I'm going to pour over a lot of scripture because there is a lot of scripture regarding prophecy. Uh, that being said, I know it's been a week since we studied prophecy. I want to remind us what is the point? Why do we study prophecy? It's not so we can leave here uh, saying, boy, I have a head full of knowledge. I know something somebody else doesn't. Or, I, boy, I have a corner on prophecy. No, the reason we study prophecy, Revelation 19.10, says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy ought to motivate us to have a greater urgency to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. Um, that being said, you know, I didn't do this uh, three and a half years ago, but I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to go to the dictionary, the old 1828 Webster's Dictionary, and I'm just going to pull out uh, what the Webster's Dictionary says. And, and as I, I was saying earlier, much of tonight's message will be by and large the same thing I preached. The truth hasn't changed in three and a half years, but just with a few little twists and turns here, added scripture or other thoughts and comments. Uh, but when I went to the Webster's Dictionary today, I just said, you know, what? I'm just going to simply look up what does the what does the Webster's dictionary say about tribulation and wrath? And, and the reason this matters again is there are a lot of, there's a lot of confusion when people read some things in the Bible that ought to be put under the category of tribulation, they're putting them under the category of wrath. 
And so there's a lot of confusion. Tonight I want to clear up that confusion to see that yes, there is a difference between wrath and tribulation. There is a difference. There's a big difference. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you will give us understanding. Lord, you told us to study, to show ourselves approved unto you. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, I pray that tonight uh, we will lay aside all preconceived notions and ideas and that we will not be committed to a religion, but we'll be committed to what your word says. Lord, that we will simply believe your word. That we will be as the church in Berea that was more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, but then they themselves went and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So, Lord, I pray that we will be Berean Christians, that we will not just take someone else's word for it, but we will simply go to your word and trust that you will show us the truth. Now, help us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there a difference? Now, I'm going to get my own title confused. I'm going to say them both. So I'm going to preach both messages tonight. Is there a difference between tribulation and wrath, between wrath and tribulation? Well, yes, there is. And if you just simply go to Webster's Dictionary and read the difference, it's pretty clear just from reading the Webster's Dictionary what the difference is between tribulation and wrath. So I want to read those. Tribulation, what is it? It's se severe affliction. It comes from a word that literally means to thrash or to beat. And it's referring to distresses of life, vexations, and in Scripture it often denotes the troubles and distresses which proceed from persecution. That's from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. So what does it say tribulation is? It's persecution. It's affliction. And we're going to see that not only does uh, Mr. Webster believe that, but that's what God's Word teaches. That's what tribulation is. It's persecution. It's affliction. Uh, then if you go in the Webster's Dictionary, what does it say about wrath? Wrath is violent anger, vehement exasperation or indignation. Uh, it's the effects of anger. Uh, in Scripture, it's His holy and just indignation against sin. It's very angry, greatly incensed, and uh, wrathfully means violently, violent anger. It's vehement anger. So uh, I want us to see this. What the Bible says, and the Bible makes clear, that we are not appointed unto wrath as God's people. And that verse is often used to say, well, because we're not appointed unto wrath, we will never go through and the, the, the title is The Tribulation. And you won't find that in the Bible. You'll find a time of tribulation. You'll find a time of great tribulation. Again, I know for some, if this is a brand new study to you, that uh, it will take a lot of scripture, a lot of digging to, uh, to overturn some things that maybe have been cemented in your mind before. I want us to see what the Bible says. And I put forth the challenge, as I always do, when it comes to prophecy. If you can take the Bible and show me what I'm preaching is wrong, I'll gladly change. I'll gladly accept what Scripture says. I'm not interested in being in, in, in anybody's camp. I'm not interested in uh, an agenda except for God's Word. That's the agenda I'm interested in. I want to see what God's Word has to say. So go to 1 Thessalonians 1. Notice verse 1. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. By the way, hold that verse right there. Uh, we're going to wade into that. Who are the elect? And you've heard me preach it over and over. The elect are believers, very simply. Some people say, you know, the elect, that's the modern day nation of Israel. No, it is not. Biblically, who are the elect? Believers of every nation. And I'll prove that to you throughout our study. Verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. 
For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. Folks, that's who I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, if you're looking for uh, the abomination of desolation and the man of sin, you're not looking for Jesus Christ. Yes, I absolutely am looking for Jesus Christ. I just know what Jesus said would take place before he came. I'm waiting for Jesus Christ. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And verse 6, he said to this church in Thessalonica, you received these, this word, you were in much affliction, much persecution, much tribulation, but you still had the joy of the Holy Ghost in you. By the way, that reminds us, joy does not depend on our happenings. Happiness depends on your happenings. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit of God, and you can have joy even in the midst of the darkest and deepest situations. Now notice what he says, verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from, or the next four words, read them with me please, from the wrath to come. Now go to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, if you would. Chapter 5, and again, I, I can't preach everything in prophecy in one night, so bear with me as we study these things. 1 Thessalonians 5. And by the way, I want to I challenge you. Let this study drive you to the Word of God. Let it drive you to see, are these things true? Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It's very important to understand when the Bible mentions the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, the day of Christ is always a positive thing. It's believers looking for Jesus Christ and the day of the Lord is always a time of judgment. And we'll get into this in our study, but what, what's the difference in those days? They, they occur on the same day. The day of, the, of Christ, the day of the Lord, they occur on the same day. The day of the Lord, though, is referring to judgment, God bringing judgment upon this earth. And it says that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. What does that mean? It means you're not looking for it. You're not expecting it. Uh, some of you, again, you may remember that movie from back in the 60s or 70s uh, called Thief in the Night. How many of you remember that? Yeah, there was this movie and had this, this spooky sound and music and, and uh, you know, I wish we'd all been ready. And then there's this, you know, the, the, the razor in the, in the sink and the woman screams. How many of you remember that? Yeah, well, that wasn't real accurate scripturally, okay? Now, some parts of it were kind of accurate. Uh, but what he's saying here is that day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. It is going to surprise a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are not going to be expecting it. Just like Noah in his day. Noah was anticipating what was going to happen. But the people who did not believe what Noah preached, it took them by surprise. Lot, when God sent Lot out of Sodom, Lot knew what was coming. But the people who did not believe the message of God, it took them by surprise. The Bible says the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But don't stop there. Keep reading verse 4. But ye, brethren, who is that? Those are believers. That's us. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Is it going to come as a thief on many people? Yes, it is. But if you're a believer and you have the word of God, it should not overtake you as a thief. Because you know what God's word says. Verse 5, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to what? Verse 9, to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Verse 9 is used to say, preacher right there, verse 9, we're not appointed under wrath, so we're not going to face tribulation. Again, get this settled in your mind right now. Tribulation and wrath are two different things. They've been mixed to be one thing, but they're not. They're two totally different things. We as God's people are not appointed unto wrath. Jesus took the wrath of God for us on the cross, folks. All of our sins was placed upon, were placed on Jesus' shoulders, and he was beaten and wounded for our transgressions. We will not face the wrath of God. But often when people want to quote 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, they want to leave out 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Well, let's turn there. We don't want to leave out any scripture. 
We want to balance Scripture with Scripture. So in chapter 5, verse 9, we're not appointed unto wrath. But in chapter 3, he tells us something we are appointed unto. Notice 1 Thessalonians 3, verse number 1. He says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent to Motheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That no man should be moved by these, what's the next word, verse 3, by these what? Afflictions for yourselves know that we are, what's the next word? Appointed thereunto. Now hold on, in chapter 5 he said we're not appointed unto wrath. But right here he said we are appointed unto what? What did he say? Afflictions. Keep reading. The Bible defines itself. Verse 4. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer. What's the next word? Tribulation. Tribulation even as it came to pass. And ye know. Chapter 5 says we're not appointed unto wrath. Chapter 3 says we are appointed unto affliction and tribulation. That's what God's word says. So again, number one, what is wrath? It's hot, passionate, fiery, cruel, fierce, violent, consuming, anger, and outrage. And the Bible mentions wrath and wrathful and wraths over 200 times in the Bible. And wrath can be man's wrath towards another man, vehement anger. And there are many examples of that. Genesis 39, 19, if you want an example. Genesis 49, 7. Uh, in fact, let's look at one of these just to get, uh, we looked at all of these, I think, last time. And uh, I want to encourage you to maybe go back and look at some of these. But look at Genesis 39, verse 19. Uh, the Bible says, uh, it says, And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife. This is Potiphar with Potiphar's wife. It says, Which she spake in him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me. She's accusing Joseph of, of uh, immorality, of wrongdoing, that his wrath was kindled. What's wrath? Again, it's vehement anger. Vehement anger. So wrath can be wrath of a man towards another man. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Wrath in Revelation a few times can be Satan's wrath towards believers and towards God. Satan has vehement anger towards God and towards believers. Notice Revelation chapter 12. And if you would go to verse number 9. The Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, praise God, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto to you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time and when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth he what's the next word he what persecuted persecuted affliction tribulation he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child wrath can be man's wrath towards another man it can be the devil's wrath towards believers but the majority of time in revelation and when we're looking at prophecy the wrath mentioned is God's wrath towards a wicked and rebellious world. Just to put this in context, I want you to think about what happens before God pours out His wrath. God's children are being murdered and martyred. I mean, they're, they're, they're being slaughtered, and the, the people doing it love blood, the Bible says. You think God just winks at that? If somebody wanted to harm your family, would you just wink at that? No, I think we would see your wrath. God is going to pour out His wrath upon a wicked world after they have persecuted and afflicted his children, his people. Now, uh, I want you to see a few examples of this. Go to Exodus 15, if you would. Exodus chapter 15. And again, the vast majority of the wrath mentioned in Revelation and in all areas of prophecy is referring to God's wrath, God's vehement anger. Uh, notice in uh, Exodus uh, 15... Exodus 15, verse 7. This is when God has overthrown the Egyptians who had been 
harming his people, enslaving his people, beating his people, killing his people. And here they're singing the song of Moses, Exodus 15, verse 7. And it says, In the greatness of thine excellency thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Go to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. Notice verse 22. By the way, notice what God says about widows and about fatherless children and your attitude towards them. Boy, this is so important. Look at this. Exodus 22, verse 20. Actually, go to 21 as well, talking about a stranger, a a foreigner in your land. Notice verse 21. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child if thou afflict them. Remember that word affliction is the same as tribulation and persecution. If thou afflict them in any wise... And they cry it all unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath shall wax hot. And I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. He said, if you persecute and you cause tribulation and affliction to people who don't have anyone to defend them, I will get vehemently angry. Folks, this is no different than what we read in the prophecy in Revelation. When the world is persecuting God's people, Once God pulls us out of here, he pours out his wrath upon a wicked, ungodly world. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these verses. Go to Matthew 3. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse number 7. So again, the majority of the time when we're reading about wrath as it regards to prophecy, in regards to prophecy, it's God's vehement anger against a wicked, wicked world. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees, And Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, go with me to Revelation chapter 6. I want us to understand there's a difference. And as we study end times, I hope to make clear when we're in a passage, whether we're looking at tribulation or whether we're looking at wrath. Again, please understand there is a vast difference between the two. Revelation chapter 6, notice verse number 9. The Bible says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were what? Verse 9, chapter 6, that were what? Slain. They've been murdered and martyred for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. What is this? Is this wrath or tribulation, folks? What is it? Verse 9. It's tribulation. It's persecution. It's affliction. Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. They said, Are you going to avenge our blood? Now, when God does avenge their blood, what is that? Is that tribulation or is that wrath? It's wrath. It's God on offense. It's God on the attack. White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Folks, we live in an amazing bubble of freedom in America. We truly do. Let's not forget that. And by the way, if we ever fail to use that freedom, if we ever give up that freedom, just for the, just for the sake of ease, we may very well lose that freedom. We need to use our freedoms while we have them to assemble and worship. We need to use our freedoms to study and preach and share the Bible, to witness, to stand up for Jesus Christ. We need to use our freedoms. But right here in verse 11, he's talking about fellow servants also being killed. Is that wrath or is that tribulation? Which is it? It's tribulation. It's still God's people being murdered, martyred, and afflicted. But now begin in verses 12 through 17. And if you'll notice what is happening here, God is pouring out his wrath during and after these verses. In fact, notice what it says, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. By the way, does that sound familiar, a hymn that we sing? And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Praise God. What happens? 
The same day God takes us out, he begins to pour his wrath out upon a wicked world. So notice again what he says here. He says, verse, uh, verse 12, I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men. By the way, what you'll find is what often happens in communist or socialistic countries is going to happen in the end times to the whole world. What is that? That a very few people at the top will control most of the power and the wealth of the world while much of the rest of the world suffers. And notice these people who have been murdering and martyring God's people, they're going to notice verse 15, it includes even the lowest among them. It says, every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? The great day of his wrath has come. God pours out his wrath during and after these verses. Uh, I want to show you a few other examples. And again, we could go to many. I'm going to go to less examples than I did last time. But if you want more references, there, there are hundreds, literally a couple hundred references in the Bible. But go to Revelation chapter 14. Notice Revelation 14 verse 10. And it's talking about any man who worships the beast in his image. And it's important to note this, and we'll dig into this more when we get there, but the mark of the beast is always associated also with the worship of the beast, always. This isn't like just having your Kroger card, folks. It's not. This, this will affect those people who have the mark of the beast, where they will worship the beast. And the Bible says, verse 9, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in, and it doesn't say on, it says in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Look at verse 19 of chapter 14. It says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of of God, verse chapter 15, verse 1, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. By the way, are we here while God is pouring out his wrath? No, we are not. Folks, we are appointed unto affliction. We are appointed unto tribulation. We are not appointed unto wrath. God pours out his wrath and we are out of here. We are gone. Look at uh, verse 7 of chapter 15. It says, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. Now go to chapter 16. Again, I'm skipping some verses here. There's so many. All of chapter 16 talks about the wrath of God being poured out. If you notice, verse 1, it says, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. What's wrath? God's vehement anger. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Are we here as believers? No, we are not. God's wrath is being poured out on a wicked world. Verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And we could read the rest of this chapter. It's all about the wrath of God. Folks, we are not here for the wrath of God. Go to Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 15. Revelation 19, verse 15. The Bible says when we come back with the Lord, we will come back with the Lord, by the way. He comes once, we meet him in the air. He comes again to the earth, we come with him. Notice verse 15, it says, Out of his mouth, Jesus' mouth, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. We looked at this in Sunday school. What does it mean? It means God will judge the nations. There are many people who will not want Jesus Christ to rule and reign, but he will rule and reign. It will be his way. It won't be a constitutional republic. It won't be a democracy. There will be no vote. It won't go to a supreme court. He is the supreme judge. It will go to him. 
And he will rule with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 5, if you would. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Ephesians 5, 1 through 6. And as I've said, you know, when I studied this, I, I went through all 200 passages. And I'm not going to read those tonight, don't worry. We still have an hour and a half tonight. No, just kidding. We have 15 minutes tonight or so. But look at Ephesians 5. And he talks about not being like the world. In fact, just look at verse 3. He says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. That's not how saints behave. That's what he said. Don't, don't act that way. That's not how saints behave. Verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And go to one more. Go to Romans chapter 1, if you would. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So wrath, again, it can be man's wrath towards another man. It can be the devil's wrath towards believers. But usually when it comes to prophecy, it's God pouring out his wrath upon a wicked, rebellious world. Believer, the good news, what is it? Jesus took God's wrath for all believers. Romans chapter 5, I read it this morning. It says, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. How many of us are righteous? None of us. How many of us are good? None of us. God brings his love down to our level. It says, but God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then it says, much more than being now justified. I'm just as if I never were even a sinner in the eyes of God. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, does anybody know what the next word is? Wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, and we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more we shall be saved by his life. Folks, Jesus took God's wrath for all believers. We will never go through the wrath of God as it is poured out upon this world. So number one, what is wrath? It's hot, passionate, fiery, cruel, fierce, violent, consuming, anger, and outrage. And in context of prophecy, it's God on offense. It's God attacking. You may remember when Jesus said about himself as the cornerstone, he said, if someone falls on him, they'll be broken. But on whomsoever he shall fall, what did it say he will do? He will grind them to powder. He said, if God, if God gets you in his sights, you're in trouble. And folks, that's what the wrath of God is. God pours out his wrath upon a world that has been persecuting, afflicting, and causing tribulation for his children. So number two, what is tribulation? Again, I read us the dictionary definitions. But I want us to see what the Bible says. What is tribulation? It's persecution. It's oppression. It's adversity. It's trouble. Tribulation or tribulations. It's found 26 times in the Bible. And as I've already shown us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, We're not appointed unto wrath, but to uh, obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But 1 Thessalonians 3 says, We are appointed unto affliction. We are appointed unto tribulation. So again, what is it? Well, it's used many ways. It's the same thing, though, oppression and adversity. Look, look at, uh, go to uh, Judges. Let's take that example. Persecution, tribulation, adversity, they're all the same thing. Uh, go to Judges chapter 10, verse 10. And I simply want to lay the groundwork tonight to help us understand there's a big difference between tribulation and wrath. There's a big difference. Judges chapter 10, verse 10, it says, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee. Both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Manites did oppress you? And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand, yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. 
Again, I want us to understand this is a very generic term. It simply means trouble, affliction, persecution. Say, but what about the capital T, tribulation? You're not going to find that in the Bible. And we'll, we'll keep digging into that. I'll prove that to you over time. Again, what, what is tribulation? It's oppression. It's adversity. It's persecution. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. I don't just want to take Webster's Dictionary for it. I want to show it to you out of the Bible. That tribulation is persecution. Matthew 13, verse 21, talks about someone who doesn't have root in themselves. It says, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or, what's the next word? Persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Go to Matthew 24. And in our study, we'll spend a lot of time in Matthew 24. In fact, I want to encourage you. I, I, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I, want to, I really do, and I know I say this a lot, but I, I absolutely mean this. I want to encourage you to lay aside all your prophecy books and study the book. Okay? You know, if, if you will do that and you'll know what this book says, then maybe you can go back to those books once you know fully what this book says. Then maybe you can eat around the bones of some of those other books. But folks, people are so misled because they have books and books and books. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a quick, easy way to learn the Bible. And really what we just need to do is study the Bible. That's what we need to do. Uh, Matthew 24, uh, notice verse 15. I simply want to lay the groundwork showing you this same event in another book in just a moment. Matthew 24, verse 15. He says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So we're talking about the abomination of desolation. It's an image that's going to be set up that they're going to worship. So that's what we're talking about here in Matthew 24. Now go down to verse 21. He says, After that, after that abomination of desolation, then shall be, what are the next two words? Great tribulation. Wait a minute, that's the last three and a half years. That's not what God's Word says. I know that's what some charts say. But what it says is it's great tribulation. What's tribulation? Persecution. Affliction. How, how is it any greater than being killed? Again, we have an amazing bubble of freedom in America, but every year there are 80 to 100,000 people around the world being slain for Jesus Christ in many countries. 80 to 100,000. What is great tribulation? It's going to be more widespread. Notice, then shall be great tribulation. And please don't miss this. There's a teaching going around saying, hey, this has already been fulfilled. Oh, no, it hasn't. Look at verse 21. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So there's another teaching that's been coming out saying, well, that's all been fulfilled, Daniel's 70th week. No, folks, this says, if you, if you believe that, then what you have to believe is that's the greatest tribulation persecution that's ever been, that ever will be. That's not what God's Word teaches. Now, notice again, now verse 22, it except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, again, who are the elect? Well, I'll have to prove that to you. But for now, you can take my word until I prove it to you. Who are the elect? It's not the modern-day nation of Israel. It's every believer. The elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then go to verse 27. It says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Say, but that's the coming, not the rapture. Wait, 1 Thessalonians 4, the rapture passage, calls what we've called the rapture the coming of the Lord. And look for the characteristics right here. Verse 28, Whither, wheresoever the carcass is there, will the eagles be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. Who are the elect? Believers. From the four winds, from one end of heaven, to the other. Now, that being said, go to Mark 13. This is a parallel passage. And if you haven't studied this yet, what you want to do are take these passages, line them up. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, Revelation 6, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Line them up and you'll see they line up. You know, the reason most people are confused is because they're trying to force the scriptures into their preconceived notion. If you just put the scriptures together, they line up. Look at Mark chapter 13, 
And notice verse 14, a little different verbiage. Mark 13, so in Matthew 24, he talked about tribulation. Mark 13, verse 14, it says, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, so we're speaking of the same events here. Now go down to verse 19 and notice a different word he uses. Verse 19, For in those days shall be affliction. When Matthew 24, he called it tribulation. Did you see that? Have you ever heard somebody say, The seven years affliction is coming? <laughs> No, folks, what, this is just talking about, again, what's tribulation? It's persecution. It's typically man, God allowing man to persecute other men. In those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Verse 24, he goes back to the word tribulation. But, after, but in those days, after that, tribulation. So, what is, what is tribulation? It's oppression, it's adversity, it's affliction. Uh, again, we could go to many more verses. And if you want more verses, I can give you these notes, let you look these up on your own. But go back to one place we've already been. Go to 1 Thessalonians again, chapter 3. I simply want to establish tonight that there's a big difference between tribulation and wrath. There's a big difference. We are not appointed unto wrath, but we are appointed unto tribulation, unto affliction. John 16, Jesus said, In the world ye shall have, what did he say? Ye shall have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The Bible also says that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now, would that, would that be true just for believers all the way up until the very last group of believers? No. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, notice verses 3 and 4 again. He said, No man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. If you're, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you stand up for Jesus on your job, you're going to have some persecution. If you stand up for Jesus in school, you're going to have some persecution. If you stand up for Jesus uh, in your family, you might have some persecution. Verse 4, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. So again, number three, last of all, and, and we could go to Revelation multiple places. Revelation 2 that talks about suffering tribulation. Number three, what is the difference between tribu tribulation and wrath and prophecy? Tribulation is men oppressing and persecuting believers, and not just believers, by the way, other men as well. You know, people say, God's not done with Israel. You're absolutely right about that. As a matter of fact, if you read Zechariah, the modern-day nation of Israel is going to suffer in a major way. They're going to suffer. The Bible says that there's tribulation. It's men oppressing and persecuting believers. It's also the wrath of Satan towards other believers. In a nutshell, it's what the world and Satan do to all men, including believers. It's what God allows to happen. But wrath as pertaining to supernatural events in the Bible is where God is on the attack, where God pours out his vehement anger upon a wicked, Christ-rejecting, Christian-murdering and martyring world. Say, Pastor, I thought there were going to be multitudes saved in the seven years' tribulation. I'll show you from the Bible that's not the case. I'll show you from the Bible that again, it's not the seven years tribulation. So what's the timeline? Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but the basic timeline is this. There's going to be a point of a little bit over three and a half years of tribulation and great tribulation. And then we're going to be out of here sometime after that, a little bit past the three and a half year point. Don't know how to say how long. Some people are guessing at 45. I know this. The Bible says none of us know the day or the hour. That's what God's word says. But he does say we can know the season. He does say that. Say, it's going to come on us as a thief in the night. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. That, that, they, that day should overtake you as a thief. And again, those who say, well, no, I just, you know, I just want to close my eyes and believe that I'm never going to go through anything. It's just not biblical. In fact, 2 Peter says that we're to arm ourselves with the mindset that we're going to suffer for Jesus. That's okay. Jesus suffered for us. Jesus took our place. It's okay to stand up for Jesus. Be of good cheer, he said, I've overcome the world. Wrath is when God goes on offense, pours out his judgment on a wicked Christ-rejecting world. Does the church face tribulation, even a time of great tribulation? Yes, but the church will never face the wrath of God. 
Jesus faced the wrath of God for us on the old rugged cross. Let's bow our heads together, please. Again, what I want to encourage you to do, I, I skipped many, many, many verses about tribulation and wrath, but here's what I want. I hope this motivates you to do something. If maybe there's some in here tonight, you say, I've never heard this and I disagree. I, that's fine. You don't have to agree, but go to the Bible and see if these things are so. Go find out if they're true. And take your Bible and show me where they're not true. I mean, just do it. Dive into it. There are no prophecies of any private interpretation. Nobody has a corner on the Bible. We don't need a spiritual pope, a spiritual priest to go to God for us and to give us some secret that God only gave to them. No, God's word is open for us to read, to study. So my challenge is, and truly, this is my challenge. I don't want you to believe these things because I have preached them. I hope you will go to the word of God and say, are these things so? Do I believe what I believe because God's word says it? Or do I believe what I believe because some man-made book says it? Or because that's just what I've always thought? Test, test the truth. You know, that's the thing about truth. It's not afraid of an examination. It's not. Just go to the Bible, see if these things are so. God's word says that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We're not appointed unto wrath. Who took the wrath of God for us? Jesus Christ did. On the old rugged cross, he paid the full price for our sins. Praise him for it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed tonight. Is there anyone tonight? Say, Pastor, I'm not even sure I'm saved. Please pray for me. I'm concerned about my soul. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I'm not sure I'm saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you are saved, you know Jesus suffered God's wrath for you in your place on that old rugged cross. Would you lift your hand and give him thanks and praise? Would you just thank him again for saving you? Think of what he did, what he went through on Calvary for you. Give him praise for it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Again, what's the point of prophecy? The point is not to go out and argue with people. The point, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't waste time arguing with somebody. If they want to know what the truth is, I'm happy to show them the Bible. But I'm not going to waste time arguing. The point isn't to go debate. The point isn't to you know, stir up trouble. The point of knowing the truth is to give us an urgency to get others to Jesus Christ. You know, the, the family, the, the man who is saved today, that's the point of prophecy. The family who followed Jesus in baptism today and uh, the young lady who followed Jesus in baptism who want to grow in the Lord, that's the point of prophecy. It's to give us that urgency to do the job Jesus left us here to do. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, who would say, Dear Lord, use me this week. Use me this week to have an urgency to get the gospel to somebody. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us to remember what we've heard tonight. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Put a hedge about us. Lord, I uh, lift up in a special way the Gaskins family tonight. Give them comfort, I pray, as only you can. And, Lord, bring us back safely the next time. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.